Hi, this is Wilkins chapter 27 protocols, excuse me, protocols for prevention and control of dental caries. We have our learning objectives, which are in the textbook as well. And let's dive right on into the nitty gritty, <clears throat> excuse me. So as you know, dental caries is an infectious transmissible disease. It's also preventable. So if a caries infection occurs in the oral cavity, strategies exist to control the disease, reverse it in its early stages, and prevent further infection. So dental hygienists have new information from the current research to share with their patients to increase their understanding of the dental caries process and disease prevention. So on the tooth surface, you have a constant process of demineralization and remineralization going on. This process takes place throughout the life of the tooth. Protocols exist to address caries disease prevention, as well as management at the various stages of lesion development, and the goal being to halt and control the disease process. The basic caries process starts with certain acetogenic bacteria in the dental biofilm acting to metabolize the fermentable carbohydrates ingested by the patient. Then the acids are formed that in turn act to demineralize the enamel, the cementum, and the dentin and lead to cavity formation. So uh, we know that the interrelation uh, of the microorganisms, the tooth, the salivary factors, as well as cariogenic, micro, uh, cariogenic foods all play a part in the caries process. So review your terminology um, on box 27.1, because those are important terms. Let's talk just a little bit about acetogenic bacteria because uh, we know that the mouth contains over 700 species of bacteria, but there are specific bacteria in the biofilm on the tooth surfaces that metabolize acid from the fermentable carbohydrates ingested. Although there are many acid-forming bacterias, only really two groups of bacteria predominate in the caries process. You've got your mutans streptococci um, or the streptococcus mutans or the streptococcus sobrinus, as well as the lactobacillus species. So you've got uh, bifidobacteria that are also associated in childhood caries. But the mutans, the strep mutans are infectious organisms that colonize the teeth and help to form the dental biofilm through their ability to create a sticky environment for their survival as well as multiplication. So the strep mutans, as well as the bifidobacteria, are most active during the initial stages of demineralization and cavity formation, whereas the lactobacilli are more active during the progression of the oral cavity. So permanent colonization of the child's teeth with the mutans um, can take place soon after tooth eruption. Transmission of the acid-forming organisms is usually from a close family member, particularly the mother. So what is the role of the fermentable carbohydrates? Commonly consumed fermentable carbohydrates include things that contain sucrose, glucose, fructose, as well as cooked starch. Acids produced during the metabolic processes include um, acetic, lactic, formic and propionic acids. Now there have been um, test questions as well as board questions on the type of acids, acetic, lactic, formic, and propionic. So frequent ingestion of fermentable carbohydrates can have a strong influence on the amount of acid produced as well as the extent of tooth destruction. The acid formed passes freely through the tiny diffusion channels between the enamel rods or into the exposed root surface. The acids can dissolve the enamel crystals into calcium and phosphate ions. And then the subsurface uh, initial carious lesion is formed. So it's observed clinically as a white area. The process of demineralization and remineralization are natural processes as the fluids in the oral cavity are constantly striving to maintain an equilibrium. 
Demineralization is the process by which the minerals of the tooth structure are dissolved into um, a solution by the organic acids produced from the fermentable carbohydrates by the acetic bacteria. So with repeated bathing of the tooth surface with the acids produced in the course of the day, the tooth demineralization can outpace the remineralization process. And then the end result of this activity is a cavitated carious lesion. Smooth surface caries and pit and fissure carious lesions can result in cariogenic nutrients that are available. Then you also have the remineralization. And that's the process of moving minerals back into the tooth surface or the subsurface of the enamel. And saliva provides the protective factors to promote remineralization. So we've got our saliva. Protective factors of healthy saliva can balance or reverse the destruction of um, the tooth surface. Saliva has many properties and functions. It buffers the acids. It supplies minerals to replace calcium and phosphate ions dissolved from the tooth during demineralization. But low saliva flow or xeriostomia uh, really reduces that buffering capacity and the acids in the demineralization process. So maintaining a neutral or basic pH is also necessary to maximize remineralization. And as you know, uh, we've discussed about the critical pH for enamel as well as cementum. The exposure to topical fluoride can also increase the availability of the salivary levels of fluoride. Fluoride accumulation in saliva comes from many sources, including water, toothpaste, and some foods. So we have fluoride mechanisms as well, and they can inhibit demineralization. Fluoride available in the biofilm, as well as the saliva, can flow into the enamel diffusion channels in the root surface and attach in the form of a hydrogen fluoride um, as the oral environment attempts to achieve its equilibrium. And this enhances remineralization, but you have to have saliva, uh, saliva in a sufficient quantity in order for this process to occur. So the buffering process of saliva can actually neutralize the acid pH. And this change in pH can reverse the equilibrium, driving calcium and phosphate, as well as fluoride, back into the tooth surface. The resulting fluorapatite bond is stronger than the hydroxyapatite bond, resulting in a stronger tooth surface. Saliva also can inhibit, or fluoride, excuse me, can also inhibit bacterial growth. So in biofilm, the hydrogen fluoride um, ion diffuses through the cell membrane of the acetic bacteria and inside the cells um, is disassociated and the fluoride ions actually interfere with the essential enzyme activity within the bacterial cell walls. We have dental caries and diagnosis detection which is changing um, how we treat and diagnose but formally the term dental caries referred only to the destructive lesion of the tooth structure that penetrated the tooth surface and created a cavity. But dental caries made its way through um, the enamel and into the dentin or through the cementum and into the dentin or the root caries. So diagnosis meant detection of decay with the loss of tooth substance. When unrestored, dental caries continued into the pulp creating a toothache, which required a root canal therapy or root canal treatment or an extraction. The patient went through their dental hygiene recare regularly to find new cavities. Now that dental caries is treated as an infection and the end stage of the infection is the hole or the cavity that requires therapy or restorations. So the diagnosis of dental caries as an infection has really transformed what formerly was a detection of the cavities that needed to be filled into identification at each stage of the disease process and then therapies to try and halt or reverse. So early diagnosis and detection of carious lesions while still in the subsurface, incipient or non-cavitated state allows us to educate the patient 
provide strategies and perform preventive treatments that can actually reverse the lesion. What are some of the prerequisites for a carious lesion detection? You need adequate lighting, you need sharp eyes or magnification loops, and you need blunt instruments. We're not using sharp explorers anymore because remineralizing surfaces must not be scratched or altered in any way. So current diagnosis um, or diagnostic bite wing radiographs can be useful in detecting interproximal carious lesions, but generally don't detect early remineralizable lesions. Vertical bite wings, as we know, are most effective for determining and diagnosing root caries. So let's talk about the stages of the infection. You have your initial stage, all right? And that's when the strep mutans and other acetogenic bacteria affect the tooth surface by clinging to the tooth surface, and it's usually a smooth tooth surface, creating a biofilm, producing acid from available fermentable carbohydrates, and then the acids produced actually diffuse through the microchannels between the enamel rods, dissolves the tooth minerals, and create a subsurface lesion. After the initial lesion, you have a white area lesion, and that's the early stage. So you've got your invisible stage, which is the subsurface, then the early stage is your white area, and that's when you run a blunt probe um, gently over the surface and blowing air under a bright light can actually show the white area of the subsurface demineralization. It, the appearance is dull, the surface is smooth, so you want to examine carefully because the surface must not be broken or scratched. Uh, picking or scratching a mineralizing surface can actually prevent further remineralization. <coughs> <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So we've really changed how we're <clears throat> attacking these teeth, checking for cavities. We're no longer sticking an explorer in there to see if, to see if it sticks. Remineralization <clears throat> process starts with the buffering processes from the saliva, including calcium, phosphate, as well as the uh, fluoride that's available. So we've got our white area. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, early stage. Then we have our white area later stage, and that's called the white spot lesion. So when we run a blunt probe gently over the surface with no pressure, um, we can feel maybe a little change in texture. The appearance is going to be dull. The surface will be slightly rough, indicating the beginning of breakdown. So again, you don't want to scratch that surface. Remineralization may still be effective and allow allowed to continue if we don't interrupt that remineralization. Then we have the cavitated lesion, and that's, we're using visual exam. It's an open lesion that can be observed. The open lesion has no intact tooth surface over the, um, over the surface, so gentle <clears throat> air may be sufficient to actually clear the loose biofilm and debris for direct vision. For instrument examination, we want to avoid picking and scratching the surface because bacteria can spread from the lesion into an unaffected tooth surface. So the probe or explorer um, is really not needed for the visual examination of the occlusal, facial, or palatal or lingual open lesions. But small interproximal caries at the contact areas uh, require radiographic interpretation. So for the radiographic um, examination, horizontal bite wings are primarily used for proximal surfaces. Uh, vertical bite wings are for not only the proximal surfaces, but root surfaces as well, especially for patients that have had past periodontal involvement. We have early caries that aren't extending into the dentin that we can see radiographically and we can't reveal the depth because of the tooth density. And then we've got the large open lesions that don't need radiographic examination because we can see them. So you, the dental hygienist, can detect carious lesions. Typically, the dentist diagnoses the caries and plans the appropriate intervention, but they rely on us to make the preliminary examination. 
let's talk a little bit about the um, history of caries management. So in the early half of the 20th century, the history of dental caries management included placing restorations, removing diseased teeth, as well as providing prosthetic replacements. But reductions in caries incidence of about 40 to 60% since 1945 in the United States were observed for those areas fortunate enough to live in communities with fluoridation of the water supply. And as the 20th century progressed, a continued drop in the dental caries prevalence was generally related to the widespread home use of fluoridated toothpaste and mouth rinses, as well as professional topical applications of fluoride gels, and now we're using uh, the varnishes. In the early 21st century, studies showed caries prevalence has remained the same or even increased in some populations in the United States. So dental caries is still a major problem in the health and welfare of adults, adolescents, as well as children. We need to determine the current status of the dentition when we're assessing uh, caries risk, including the restored and unrestored surfaces. So we, as the dental hygienists, are usually the first ones to do the hard tissue charting of existing uh, restorations and that type of thing. So we're charting existing re restorations, including sealants. We're charting cavitated carious lesions, which again is the final stage of the caries process. And we are also charting secondary recurrent carious lesions and we're um, determining sealants that might need repair. So the white spot lesions or the demineralized areas can benefit from remineralization. Radiographically, we're looking at uh, carious lesions. We are trying to determine whether or not an area needs to be restored. Active carious lesions need to be charted and the dentist will determine the restorative interventions. Um, for determining the area that require remineralization, there is an outline appropriate um, for strategies for the patient. So we're going to uh, define the steps of the remineralization program. And you, as a new graduate, might be the first person in the office to want to establish a remineralization program for the office. But we need to explain the needs and discuss the process of remineralization with the patient. We apply principles of motivational interviewing to assess the patient's understanding and to gain uh, patient acceptance because they have to buy into the fact that you have an infection that's causing a cavity and we need to halt this infection. So we prepare and explain the risk assessment to the uh, patient. And with the patient, we select and demonstrate procedures that need to be followed for their particular case. So we plan for evaluation and reevaluation at their continuing care appointments. So we talk a lot about risk factors. Uh, risk factors can be habits, behaviors, lifestyles, or conditions that when present, increase the probability of the disease occurring. So the risk factors um, are listed on the table 27-1, um, apply primarily to adults and teenagers. We do have a whole chapter on the pediatric patient that we'll be getting into uh, in another semester. But caries management begins with the risk factor assessment, and you'll be doing that on each of your patients, and that's the caries risk assessment that follows the uh, extraoral, intraoral examination. So this allows you to provide individualized recommendations. So we've got the caries risk assessment, and um, that's using the patient's own list of risk factors, okay, to determine what their risk level is. So we can use that to discuss individual oral conditions with the patient and provide factual information to the patient about the development and transmissibility of the cariogenic bacteria. Then we can relate the patient's cavitated carious and white spot lesions to behavioral and lifestyle habits that will need to change to improve the balance between the remineralization and the demineralization. So this caries risk assessment, there's several of them that are available. We uh, formulated one at Northern Virginia Community College that follows closely with the American Dental Association's um, Canberra. But we're using the patient's own list 
of risk factors that uh, in turn we can motivate the patient with. So we want to encourage the patient to apply caries preventive strategies also to family and other closely related individuals by applying the principles of motivational interviewing. So we need to be a guide for the management of the caries prevention plan for reversing and demin the demineralized lesions. So we need to identify and evaluate risk. And a lot of information has been collected during the patient's medical, dental history, social history, that include medications that may promote dry mouth, systemic factors that uh, may affect oral health, and the patient's perception of need. Uh, and that may be seen from past dental experiences, um, family, as well as cultural influences. And we also determine the value placed on oral health by detecting um, their understanding of the patient's perspective on appearance, cost, and personal time involved. Past dental experience is shown by uh, primary, uh, pre primarily prevention, right? Or do they have sealants, okay? Primary prevention. Secondary prevention, are the decayed areas restored and tertiary prevention have extractions or replacement of missing teeth taken place. Fluoride history in the form of home, water fluoridation, um, are they using county water and the availability of community water supply fluoridation throughout the life is asked about. And other exposures to fluoride, including toothpaste that have been used over the years, as well as professional applications in the dental office. So success depends on changing habits, such as when the person who was a tobacco user is now able to stop smoking or has com completely become um, non-addictive to the tobacco products. So we want to have a patient-centered interview and briefly introduce the checklist to the patient. On box 27.2, um, there's a list that may initiate conversation and stimulate interest. Some of these caries risk assessments are part of the pre-appointment where the patient does this out in the reception room with a checklist or on the computer before the hygienist takes them back. Other things you can do also is to discuss um, their food intake. The caries risk assessment does ask about the type of foods the patient ingests and the frequency, but further food diaries may need to be done to analyze the amount of sugar exposures. And you'll be getting into that within nutrition and in another chapter. But um, you want to um, discuss with the patient everything you can to educate them on what they can do to minimize their risk, halt the process, and reverse the process if that's, um, if that's the situation, as well as not transmit the disease to other family members. So participation in the process of selection can inform the patient as well as the parents of the needs and ways to coping uh, with the change. So besides each risk factor, um, you allow the patient to identify possible changes that they can do to prevent future caries because they have to be the ones to initiate the changes. There could be systemic disease factors, so identifying uh, the diseases, conditions, or medications that may be uh, contributing to this, such as dry mouth and what interventions can be done for that. Medically or nutritionally compromised patients may be at risk for dental caries and need additional preventive measures. Let's talk a little bit about CAMBRA. And CAMBRA stands for Caries Risk and Management by Risk Assessment. So you've got your risk factors, which we've discussed for periodontal disease and other conditions. Risk factors are habits, behaviors, lifestyles, or conditions that, when present, increase the probability of the disease occurring. So on table 27.1, there's a list of risk factors that apply, again, primarily to the adults. And another chapter will delve into the children but caries management begins with the risk factor assessment. And again, this allows you to provide individualized help for the patient. 
There are several CARES risk assessment tools that aid in uh, the systematic collection of the data. Uh, a lot of them are free and on the internet, Philip Sonicare has one, Colgate has one, uh, L uh, Previsor, P-R-E-V-I-S-E-R, -E has a number of them which can be free for the patient and they do that prior to their appointment and they're very simple for the patient to use. It's just yes or no questions. And then they have a green for good, a yellow for caution and a red for something needs to be done. So um, it is very user friendly. But again, using the patient's own list of risk factors can be significant in the educational experience. You wanna provide factual information about the development and transmissibility of the cariogenic bacteria and relate the patient's cavitated carious as well as white spot lesions to behavioral and lifestyle habits that may need to change. So we encourage the patient to apply these caries uh, preventive strategies also not only to themselves but to family members and other closely related individuals. So we are the guide for the patient. So we're looking at um, what we can do to prevent, to reverse, and to treat. So we're looking at both primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention for this. So we talked a little about uh, systemic factors. We've got the xerostomia, the medical, uh, medically compromised patient. Now for xerostomia, if they have Sjogren's, that is a systemic disease, autoimmune, where there is a lack of all sorts of lubrication in the body, including the mouth. Uh, and that's very difficult to manage. A lot of the xerostomia patients experience are from the medications they take. And almost every medication that's being prescribed these days seems to have a um, side effect of xerostomia. So we are trying to counteract those effects with um, oral hygiene habits that the patient can use. So we need to plan care. And uh, with that, we need the uh, risk levels, right? So we're challenged to try and select a management strategy based on the patient's individual needs. So the care plan will not only uh, need to provide the treatment of existing non-reversible carious lesions, but also provide a framework for changes in personal care previously unrealized by the patient so that new lesions can be prevented. So planning care will be individualized depending on the disease risk level, the physical and cognitive abilities, and the patient or the parent's desire to change. A variety of uh, patients are going to be presented for dental hygiene care. So on one side, you'll have the patient with no current or new dental caries, but a few simple questions may reveal that the patient with irregular habits of diet and personal care that uh, could actually lead to serious problems later on. And the caries risk assessment is done at the first appointment of each recare or series of appointments because depending on what's going on throughout a patient's life, the caries risk assessment will change. <clears throat> Excuse me. So at the opposite extreme, you have the need for early recognition of uncontrolled disease that presents as cavitated lesions and the need for dental restorative work. So we're making recommendations for specific caries risk levels. So the patient with a low caries risk, it's primary prevention, okay, um, that remains the top priority. We're encouraging the patient, we're giving them positive feedback and education, we're always reinforcing. We review with the patient the, their existing habits, and why they are categorized in lo a low caries risk, okay? So they've got good oral hygiene and biofilm removal, they have healthy snacking at, um, habits and their exposure to daily fluoride. So we just complement that. And we recommend routine maintenance appointments because again, changes in habits will increase their caries risk. Then we have patients with moderate caries risk 
And this patient exhibits factors that increase their risk for developing dental carious lesions. So we need to provide the patient, again, with positive feedback and support for the protective factors that they currently exhibit, such as they're drinking fluoridated water, they're using fluoride toothpaste, <clears throat> their snacks might be healthy, um, are they using sugar-free chewing gum? And then we need to work with the patient to guide them to reduce the risk factors, such as the frequency of ingestion of acetogenic beverages, the frequency of the fermental carbohydrate snacks, and improved daily biofilm removal. And the more the patient brushes with a fluoridated toothpaste, the more frequently that fluoride application will be applied to those teeth. We want to discuss additional caries preventive foods to the diet, such as nuts, sugar-free yogurt, sugar-free gum, cheese, those type of things. Um, and having the patient swish after uh, they're done eating or drinking, whatever it is. Um, you want to allow the patient to help choose changes that they think will work for them. So you're increasing the protective factors that can accomplish, uh, be accomplished by you, the hygienist, especially sealant placement and fluoride applications. And we're recommending appropriate maintenance schedules. Again, changes in habits may increase their caries risk. Then we have a patient who is at the high caries risk. And these patients display active carious lesions or has a recent history of a restoration to repair carious lesions or have medications or systemic factors that cause severe dry mouth. So the nidus of infection needs to be addressed. The reason for the infection needs to be addressed and active lesions need to be restored. Bacterial infection can be reduced and controlled with fluoride application, dental uh, biofilm removal, antimicrobial therapies can be introduced, and evaluation and strategies for reducing existing risk, risk factors need to be addressed. So strategies also for increasing protective factors are an important part of the discussion. So recommend appropriate maintenance intervals. Assess the patient's caries risk at regular intervals and review the current habits and address as needed. So a patient with a high caries risk, even though they might be um, healthy, periodontally might require more frequent um, appointments just for their caries risk. So then we have our caries management protocols. And again, table 27.1 gives you those protocols, but some recommended products and protocols require a prescription while others are available to the patient over the counter. So what are we going to recommend for the patients with the low caries risk? Okay, primary prevent prevention, again, remains the top priority. We're preventing, uh, we're providing positive feedback. We're reviewing the patient's um, existing habits and categorizing them as low caries risk. And we're recommending a routine maintenance um, appointments because again, the caries risk level can change. Now with the moderate risk, as we've discussed, you, uh, have the patient that exhibits an increase in their risk for developing dental caries. So we're providing the positive feedback. We're working with the patient to guide them to reduce their risk. And we're discussing additional preventive foods as well that they can swap with, as well as um, increasing the protective factors for the patient. So we're recommending, again, the appropriate maintenance schedule for the patient. Same thing with the patient with the high caries risk. Now they present with carious lesions already in the, in the mouth and they have a history of recent restorations or repairs because of carious lesions. Now again, that is different from a patient who had a filling break or a tooth break that needed restoration. All right, we're talking about carious lesions here. So we want to <clears throat> take care of the active infection. Uh, we want to reduce and control the infection with fluoride application, biofilm removal, as well as antimicrobial therapies. Um, we are going to help them increase the protective factors and recommend appropriate maintenance schedules. 
So again, review the table 27-1 for recommendations for preventive maintenance and therapeutic interventions. And as we said, some are um, prescription, some can be over the counter. So, what's some of the protocols for remineralization? The first approach to treating dental caries is to treat it as an infectious disease and eliminate as many of the causative factors as possible. So the uh, primary importance is daily removal of the acid forming bacteria and the fermentable carbohydrates that actually allow the harmful bacteria to survive and multiply. At the same time, the infectious agents are being reduced in numbers um, and consider, consideration for the transmissible aspect of the microorganisms is also needed. So when possible, close personal contacts with the patient and caregivers need to be checked and um, advise the relatives of the potential communicality of this disease process. We need to remove the nidus or the cause of an infection. We need to remove the carious lesions, not us personally as hygienists, but the patient. And uh, dental caries is a multifactorial disease, so it's important to know the source of the infection prior to making treatment decisions. So dental carious lesions contain a large number of acetogenic bacteria, especially the strep mutans and lactobacilli. Cavitated carious lesions must be restored or the carious lesion will remain as a source of infection. So the patient needs well-placed restorations with a marginal seal to help lower the bacterial counts in the oral cavity. Restorative materials containing fluoride are recommended whenever possible. They're now having um, bonding agents, uh, glass ionomers that have fluoride releasing ingredients in them properly placed sealants to close off the pits and fissures where more microorganisms can live and multiply need to be placed. And again, family members can continue to harbor the karyogenic microorganisms and they can transmit them from one person to the other. So we need to initiate daily preventive measures. And, um, and with that, we're using fluoridated water, okay? So we want the patient who's drinking bottled water to fill their bottles with fluoridated water, all right? It's some of the uh, water that you purchase is fluoridated, but often it is not. So uh, now with the advent of um, the um, environment and everything, the refillable bottles are becoming more popular. So we wanna make sure that they're using fluoridated water. Fluoride containing uh, toothpaste need to be used two to three times a day for brushing for at least three minutes. Now it's biofilm disruption, but it's also applying fluoride to these tooth surfaces. Alcohol-free fluoride mouth rinses may be recommended in a gel tray or a 1.1 prescription neutral sodium fluoride toothpaste before they go to bed. Um, there might be dietary modifications that need to be um, discussed, as well as chewing sugar-free gum after a meal. Now, xylitol helps reduce the strep mutans and promotes remineralization. The bacteria think of the xylitol as a fermentable carbohydrate, so they ingest it. And um, the thing with the xylitol, because of the... the carbohydrate change, chains and everything, it can't digest it. So the bacteria ends up dying from starvation. So that's one reason why xylitol products are so good inside the mouth. There are us other professionally as well as prescribed um, Applications that can be done, chlorhexidine, the um, chlorhexidine mouth rinses, the Paradax, those type of things uh, is a highly effective agent to help reduce the amount of strep mutans. Um, so a patient that has active carious lesions might be recommended to use the chlorhexidine mouth rinse for a period of three weeks twice a day to reduce the amount of strep mutans in their mouth. 
Also the neutral sodium fluoride, 1.1%, which is a prescription used twice daily. Again, can help remove uh, or reduce the strep mutans as well as a fluoride varnish for mean re bleh, remineralization. All right, so we just talked a little bit about the chlorhexidine, the neutral sodium fluoride, and the fluoride varnish. And we also have to follow up with the continuing care. So managing dental caries means that the clinician evaluates the patient for compliance at regular interval intervals. So we review the individualized caries management strategies with the patient at each recare, and we follow up with the patient. We can follow up, uh, put a tickler file in the computer so we can follow up at home and um, with phone calls or something in between their appointments because we want to customize the maintenance care appointments to monitor, educate, as well as apply preventive and therapeutic measures for the patient. So during our continuing care, one of the things that we're always doing is doing a biofilm control check. We are disclosing all of our patients when we're in school and we're using this disclose an agent to record a biofilm score which is one of the indices, and we can address oral care issues. So we are also detecting the demineralized areas that might need uh, areas that might need sealant and poor margins of restorations. Uh, radiographs, as you know, are never routine, but if a patient is at a high risk caries level, they may need radiographs prescribed more frequently than somebody that's at a low risk. So we want to discuss the details of continuation of remineralization with the patient and also reassess their needs. So the patient might be coming in every three months or every four months instead of the typical every six months if their caries risk is high, even though they have um, a stable periodontal condition. And that also gives us an opportunity to apply professional fluoride. So again, as with everything, the caries risk assessment and risk level needs are documented at each of the continuing uh, care appointments. Now at Nova, we use the Dentrix um, software system and we have templates for you to fill out. So everybody is standardized with that. And you don't go past to the next step until the template is filled out. So one of the templates is caries risk management and you're utilizing the principles of Canberra, carries management by risk assessment that allows you to evaluate and document the patient's progress and develop a treatment plan accordingly. So through documentation, it includes assessment results. Um, you're doing the initial planning where you're recording all the instructions and survey reports um, that you've done on the patient. You're noting specific oral care and dietary changes that you recommended and follow up um, with successive notes on upcoming visits. Again, if it's not written down, it never happened. And if you do follow up with phone calls or that type of thing, you want to make sure that you write that in the patient's record as well. So we're also evaluating at each of the recares um, the um, evaluation of the teeth, periodontal tissues with probing, as well as visual examinations. And we are telling the patient everything that we're doing and why, because we want the patient to be as educated as we are on what they can do throughout their life to um, help stop caries, prevent it from happening, and how they can help the early stages with the remineralization. So that is the chapter on what did we just discuss? Protocols for prevention and control of dental caries.